Good talk. Oh, I see what you did there. Good talk. Lift your hands, baby. Welcome to another episode of Good Talk with Good People. I'm Haley Hackett, your host, and I'm here with a fabulous stand-up comedian, comedy writer. He's written on Raising Hope, um, Fox's Last Man Standing, The McCarthy's. He's also a West Side Theater favorite. Um, I'm happy to have Josh Greenberg on the podcast. Hi, Josh. Hi, Haley. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, thanks for coming. It's always it's always great to like chat a little bit before and we're like, so anyways, after this intro. Um, but no, thank you so much for coming on. You just got off of writing for, you said three years on Last Man Standing, which is insane, <laughs> insane. And part of the time during the pandemic too, which is how, how did you guys adjust to that? It was really um, strange. It was a really tough adjustment because the whole sort of, premise of a multi-camera show is to have a live audience because you're sort of creating like the theater experience on a, on a, on a sound stage. And, you know, we couldn't do that. We had to film everything, you know, sort of in isolation. I'm kind of impressed that we managed to do it. I mean, we had really strict um, COVID, you know, precautions where everyone had to stay like in their bubble, but it, it is kind of impressive to have like a whole crew of, camera people and sound people and um, other, you know, technicians, wardrobe and makeup. And we made it through 21 episodes safely. So that's yeah. no outbreaks. I mean, I don't know if you can tell me if there was, but no outbreaks. <laughs> no, no. I think there were a couple like scares, but no, everything went really smoothly. And um, yeah. yeah, we didn't have, there were, I think there were other shows that had to like shut down for a while and, we somehow didn't have to do that so it was, it was yeah we kind of managed it was it was really cool yeah I, I feel like tv really was the front runner in what covid safety looked like um maybe because there was so much money in tv they're like listen we can't we can't stop seeing each other so sorry uh we're gonna invest in like the best testing but at this point i feel like being on set is like slightly safer than being on an airplane like unless you're yeah. vaccinated yeah, I mean, they're so rigorous about it, the way they keep everyone, you know, separated. Hashtag offspring. Um, but um, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it's, it, it is very impressive um, how, uh, how like good they are about keeping everyone safe. Yeah. And it was also really, I mean, the, the weirdest thing for me was the writer's room, which was entirely virtual for a year. Um, and that's that's just such a change in how the writer's room, you know, works. And I'm I'm curious to know if it's gonna, you know, stay virtual like forever or if people will gradually go back to in-person rooms. Yeah. So. I have to ask you, when I sent you a Zoom invitation today, were you slightly triggered? Like were you like, no, not this again? Um, I'm so used to Zoom now that no, it did it didn't didn't bother me at all but it, it, it's a it's like a learning curve I mean in a regular writer's room there's so many like side conversations and people interrupting other people and it's you know just like a real you know interaction of a group of people and obviously that that doesn't work over zoom because only one person can speak at a time so it's weird yeah and they're highlighted and spotlighted for everyone so it's like any gossip that you might be whispering off camera immediately becomes public. I, I don't know. I think there's so much that is missed in Zoom. Like, I think there's something to be said for like feeling and like, yes, I'm gonna sound like a hippie right now, but feeling each other's energy in a room. <laughs> like I felt that way with the podcast too, where I'm like, I, I don't know if there's like a hundred percent connection typically. There's only like 80% comprehension because you're not like seeing all the minute stuff. And you can Absolutely. also like go and do other things during Zoom, which is not great. I don't know, how has that been for you guys as like a big writer's room? Has it inhibited any creativity? Um, we were very like, uh, like high functioning writer's room, like very cohesive to begin with. So we actually did really well over, um, over Zoom. But um, yeah, there are things that are lost. Like, you know, they're like when we were all an in-person room, you could like shoot people glances like 
and instantly get what each other means, you know, like not, you know, an eye roll, but just, you know, really funny, like, you know, micro communications. And you, you can't do that on, on Zoom. Um, yeah. Everything is, is kind of out in the open. But you're totally right about like the energy also, like when we're all in a room together, there's this very like, there's this good, you know, feeling of camaraderie. And um, it's weird when, you know, you're all in separate places, just staring at, you know, these screens, so. Yeah, a hundred percent. I hope the side eye doesn't go extinct from everyone just. Oh, yeah. I hope not, I hope not. Thank God we still have the messaging so we can privately, you know, talk shit about each other, you know, uh, oh, yeah. on, <laughs> that way, but. Um, it brings you back to the AIM days, like MSN and stuff. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Trying with some friends. I remember the last time we talked, so for our listeners, Josh was very kind um, earlier during the pandemic uh, to give me some knowledge about like writing in general as I was kind of beginning to, to navigate that. So thank you again for that. That was oh, sure. phenomenal. Um, but I remember you saying that there, there's a slight age difference between you and the other writers on Last Man Standing, correct? Well, actually, it, there's so many age differences. Like, there's okay. really older writers, and I'm sort of in the middle. And then there's like super young writers. Um, I'm sure the older writers would appreciate me calling them real old writers. Um, but yeah, I mean, there there are some writers on the show who wrote for like Roseanne and Golden Girls, you know, back in in the day. Um, and then you know, I'll just say I, I fall somewhere you know, younger than that, but then there's also, you know, writers in their 20s um, who are kind of just starting out. So it's it's a really cool, like, broad spectrum of, of you know, different experiences, so. Yeah, and you see that in the show, because I guess I was initially picturing um, all these geezers and then you uh, in the writer's room, just because it, I remember you mentioning there were some older writers. Um, but in watching the show, there, there was some very young tones to things. Um, and I, I was surprised. I was like, <laughs> at first I was just like, Josh is really carrying the young crowd. <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's pretty diverse. I mean, all in all, the show is not what I expected, like, I had never really watched it when I joined it three years ago. The show has been on forever. I mean, like, a lot of people, when you tell them, they're, they're like, oh, that, that show is still on? It, it, this was its ninth season. And, you know, that took 10 years, basically, to, to, to film. But, um, like, I, I just was so surprised at, like, um, what the show was. And, and I sort of get that reaction from a lot of people who expect it to be sort of this conservative show, which is, you know, not my style at all but it's not that at all i mean it's this very sort of sweet um family comedy you know and so uh yeah and it, and it has a real diversity of age also there's you know some some young characters and stuff so. yeah and they they sound like young characters which is always fun because you you know the difference right when like uh, an older person is writing for a younger character and I guess you know that's really thanks to having such a diverse writer's room um, or at least I would imagine and it, it is I also I, I had that preconception that it was going to be a little bit more conservative something my my father might want you know what I mean right. um yeah. and I it's very enjoyable I was like oh wow look at these joke counts oh okay this is that's cool wow very very cool um let's let's like back all the way up and kind of start from the beginning of your your comedy aspirations right so what inspired you to become a comedy writer um well I always knew that I wanted to do you know something in entertainment I love you know making people laugh and stuff um and I went to um, film school and there really wasn't, at that time, there wasn't like a lot of like emphasis on comedy in film school. So it was just, you know, a small group of people who were doing like funny short films and stuff like that. And, um, you know, that we sort of, I, I feel like we sort of carved out this 
little area of like, oh, there is a space for like, you know, young aspiring writers who want to just do comedy. And I mean, I love all genres too, but I knew I wanted to write, you know, comedy. Um, and uh, it, that, it was kind of challenging to do, you know, in film school where there's a lot of sort of like pretentious, yes, yes, exactly, exactly. There. Yes, yes, a lot of serious films and stuff. But, um, but yeah, so I, I always knew I wanted to, to do something that, you know, would make people laugh. And then, um, yeah, I just spent, you know, many years in the Strugs trying to, um, you know, kind of break in. And I wrote on, you know, some weird little projects. Um, like I wrote on this, like, kooky um, Kevin Smith syndicated show that never really went anywhere. But then, and, and a couple other things. And I, I sold like a movie to Universal that kind of never went anywhere. But then um, I finally got onto Raising Hope, which was like my favorite comedy in the world. And then I was like so lucky to, to join it. Um, so, and that kind of was my first like network, you know, TV show. And then I've been on uh, a, bunch of, a bunch of stuff since then. It's been really fun. Yeah, I mean, Raising Hope is a fantastic first like network appearance as a writer you know what I mean like this track record is beautiful um I I guess like let's let's like dice this up a little bit right so like you you were in the shrugs right and and I I love that area right because it's so relatable for me I'm like okay cool you were in the shrugs you were you know um you were telling me earlier you were pressing remotes to do quality control and just pressing buttons um which is so humbling, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, I guess one thing I'm wondering is, did your film school education really have an impact on your ability to like network in the real world and like, you know, decrease the amount of time you spent in the struggles or did it have no impact whatsoever? Because that's a very dividing question. Like some people are like, you don't need film school. You could read a book, man, you know? And like some right. people are like, this changed me. Yeah, it, it's a really great question. And it's it's such a sort of personal decision because I um, I see both sides of it having gone to film school. Like I am still really close with a bunch of the people from, you know, from my class. And um, it's been really cool to see uh, how everyone has kind of like advanced. Like we were all just kind of like dorky um, students. And now many of us are dorky, um, still dorky, but, you know, working individuals. And so that part has been really cool in terms of, you know, the, the networking. Um, but, you know, it, it also was, you know, un, it was ridiculously expensive, unnecessarily expensive, in, in my opinion. And, um, you know, I, I completely respect people who are just like, no, fuck that. I don't, I don't need that. I I want to get, you know, life experience without going to film school. I mean, that's just as, you know, reasonable a a, um, a choice. For me, it was like a, a security blanket in a way to to have this kind of structure. I, I like structure. I'm very like type A. And yeah. so like I liked, you know, having deadlines and assignments and, you know, learning things in this very structured way. Um, so it worked for me, I guess. But. Yeah, we're both um we're both Virgos, which I found on right. your your West Side like bio. Right. And that's how I am too. Where I'm like, oh my gosh, like any of the classes I've taken, I'm like, thank God for a deadline. Like, thank God for a deadline or like an assignment, a book to read, something. Tell me to do something, or else like, there's so much information out there. There's just simply so much information to like sort through. Yeah. Um, I guess did like did it really inform how you write today, the things that you've learned in film school, like the actual class part? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I learned so much about like, for instance, in like, uh, like I was in the directing program actually, but um, on like the first day when I had to like be out in the sun loading a camera, I was like, ooh, this is not fun. This is not for me being outside, um, nope, um, pass. And that's when I sort of figured out I wanted to do writing instead. And um, 
So I ended up, even though I was in the directing program, I ended up taking like all the screenwriting classes. And I basically was like a screenwriting major sort of. So yeah, I learned so much from, I took every writing class that I could and I learned an enormous amount from those classes. They, um, the, the really good thing about them is like, we read a lot of classic scripts. And um, I mean, you can find those online and I recommend to anyone who's like an aspiring you know, writer, that's the main thing is just read, 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 you know, if you want to, you know, be a TV writer, read lots of pilots. If you want to be a feature writer, there's, you know, whole libraries of, of movie scripts. And it's just really important to like, see what's come before, you know. So yeah, that, that did really help shape my, um, I guess, my experience as a writer. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like, it, to some extent, it really pushed you in the writer direction. I love the fact that you decided to take more screenplay classes because you needed AC. Like, I feel like that's what that really is. You're like, outside, yeah. not my thing. Bugs, uh -uh. indoors, AC, more my style. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If I'm outside, I'm usually wearing a beekeeper's uniform or, <laughs> or the suit from the Hurt Locker because otherwise I cannot be in the sun. I'm, I'm very pale and I, I don't like the sun. So, yeah. Um, were COVID safe before any of this? <laughs> oh, absolutely. I don't know if you've seen this, but um, my wife got the two of us these like um, COVID safety helmets. I, I posted a photo of it at one point. It's the dorkiest thing in the world. It's like a glass. It looks like a scuba diver's like, you know, helmet, basically. Like the old kind where you would put a giant like fishbowl over your head. Oh, no. uh, yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I... And I wear it. I'm real proud of it. So I was going to ask you, like, take it to Sam's Club and like do a, you know, do a spin for people. Like, this is what protection looks like. 360. Yeah. Absolutely. Know? Absolutely. Walking. We, 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 um, when we first got them, we went for a walk around the neighborhood and just the looks from people was, it was like, there was such disgust in their eyes. They were like, oh, I pity you. Um, but I was like, screw you. You're going to get COVID and I'm not. So. Oh, anyway. yeah. Yeah. Listen, we're we're a PPE household here. You know what I mean. We have so many face shields. It, it's it, it's almost wasteful. You know what I mean. Right. We're like, who needs this many? Who right. you can wash them, but we we change them out. I don't. I think it's like two people with like slight OCD, <laughs> just like living together. We're totally. like enabling, <laughs> you know, hand totally. sanitizer and stuff. Um, it's it's good. But I'm glad. I'm glad you guys have um 360 protection. It's. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. It's goals. It's goals. Um, I guess I, I'm wondering, like, was there like a specific like film or show that like really inspired you um, or that you kind of just like took notes from like, oh, this is the type of shit I want to do. Right. Well, I mean, the movie that I think, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm more of a movie fan really than a TV fan. You know, I, I mean, there's TV shows that I love, but I grew up just devouring movies, you know? Um, and I think the movie that really influenced me like so much was Clue. The, I don't know, have you ever seen it? Clue, the, um, the uh, it's like from the eighties. It's based on like the board game, Clue. Uh -huh. um, and it is just an amazing movie. And it's like, um, it. I saw it as a, as a, as a kid and it just left such an impression on me. Um, it's just amazing. It's just this really brilliant kind of fast paced comedy, very sort of like screwball, you know, old old school comedy. And it's, it's so well done. I, I sort of remember like seeing that as a little kid and being like, oh yeah, I, I want to do that, you know? So yeah, that was, that was a huge, influence that's awesome i feel like well i know what i'm watching tonight you know what i mean okay, i'm gonna watch clue because i i feel like i've watched it but the problem is is that i my parents grew up in the 80s and they gave they made me watch a lot of things um that my small infant brain wasn't ready for um yeah. and didn't like remember later on um for whatever reason so i feel like i've watched a, a million movies that are relevant now but i was like too busy with legos 
you know what I mean? Like when they were showing it to me, they're like, how, how dare she not recognize this classic? And I was like, I, I can barely say my own name yet. Like, this is not that's, nice. That's um, very funny. There, <laughs> there's a lot of generational stuff like that. Like, like, you know, kids who grew up in the eighties will go on about Goonies. And Love then, like, yeah. Yeah. It's so good. And then sort of like the, um, kids from a few years after that will be like, Sandlot, they'll be all about the Sandlot, and I just think that's really interesting that like these films become like generational kind of like touchstones, you know. Oh yeah, so. because they become so part of like your childhood. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know. Unfortunately, like mines are like mine is like High School Musical and like stuff like that, which right. is right. So I don't know. As an adult, I look back and like, oh come on, let's let's do something different. <laughs> Right, the 80s right. had some good ones some really really solid classics for sure for sure yeah. definitely yeah I guess I'm curious like as you started um you know writing you're like devouring all these movies and you're reading all these scripts and you know you're really putting the work in do you look back at, at any of like the type of exercises you did um or like things you've read where you're like oh that was a waste of time like that was like a wrong turn and I took some time off of getting to where I want to be? Hmm. That's a good question, but I don't think so really. I mean, there are things like even in film school where I took like cinematography classes and stuff where, you know, you could say, well, what a fucking waste of time as I did not become a cinematographer. Um, but I guess I would argue that I learned so much about just like um, the visuals of film that even that helps with the writing. Mm -hmm. um, or like even like there was a time on um, a show where they were trying to block out like a really complicated scene. And somehow I pulled up some weird bit of information that was deep in my brain of, about like um, shoot it from a directing class on how to shoot like, uh, like a six person sitting at a round table scene. And I kind of offered these like, you know little suggestions and it felt like there were maybe some other people who didn't have the that sort of directing background so it was like oh cool you know I, I like these little like nuggets of information that somehow I, I accumulate you know uh, uh, accumulated I guess is that the right word accumulated yeah. retained, uh, accumulated retained got maybe um so yeah so I, I guess you know and, and I had you know I studied like editing and stuff like that which also I mean gosh like learning how editing works is so important for screenwriting um because you know you can write this long you know flowery scene and then it's, it's just going to get cut anyway so it saves you a lot of time to realize I know it's it's heartbreaking um, we, when I was, um, when I remember when I was in school, um, the guy who wrote, um, Air Force One came in. I, I, do you know that movie at all? Yeah, I do. Okay. Yeah. Harrison Ford is, it's like Die Hard on Air Force One, basically. Yeah. And he told this, like, story that I still think about, like, to this day, that, like, he was a new, like, kind of young writer, and he had sold this movie, and he was on set, and he was super excited about it. And he had written like a long speech for Harrison Ford to give. And he noticed that Harrison Ford had like crossed out all the script. And he was like, oh, like, uh, wh what's happening? And Harrison Ford's like, oh yeah, all these words you wrote, I can say them all with one look. And he was kind of like dejected, like, oh, okay. And he, Harrison Ford like put his arm around him and he said, hey, kid, don't don't worry about it because if you hadn't written these words I wouldn't know which look to give and I just thought that was an amazing actor story like the way actors view their craft versus the way writers do you know um so that's anyway that, that whole speech got cut and that that's all I'm talking about that like you can learn by studying these other sort of um divisions of filmmaking you can learn it, it it informs screenwriting so wow. it, it's yeah. all it's all helpful it, it it sounds extremely helpful have you ever by chance watched the show avatar the last airbender 
A little bit, yeah. It reminds me a little bit about that in some regard, because like Suko, the like fire bender or whatever, um, his uncle's like, you must learn from the water tribe and also the earth bending tribe and the air tribe to fully understand your craft. Right. <laughs> we just watched that episode last night. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so, it's so bad. Are we just avatars? You that's, know what I mean? That's probably it, yes. That's yeah. really funny. You're a writing bender and you're learning <laughs> from all these other. <laughs> That's right, the nerdiest of vendors. Yes, um, the specific in language of vendors. <laughs> oh, really, they are precise. Um, really, really funny. But have you ever seen the M. Night Shyamalan movie, The Last Airbender? Ooh, it's not good. Oof, no, um, I haven't. But now, from your reaction to it, it sounds yeah. like I made a good choice in that watch. Yeah. Yes, yes. Although, okay, I'm good. this reminds me of something else I was gonna, I was gonna say. Seeing a bad movie is also really really like a great tool in writing really I was going to ask you how you feel about bad movies um yeah. do you There's, watch a lot of them yep yep I have a, a group of friends at, who do a bad movie night and it, it we've done it for so many years and it, it's kind of sad because we, we haven't been able to do it during the you know pandemic uh, I know. I mean, not as sad as the five hundred thousand who are dead, but oh. it is still <laughs> sad in its own in its own way. Um, uh, but we used to get together and we do a double feature, and we had this like system that was like a rotating system where two people would choose that night's um, films, and it would be a surprise, and then we would just sit and try to break down the the film, and you know talk shit about it and I'm sure people do this everywhere and there's an amazing podcast called how did this get made uh, which I highly recommend um, where comedians just talk about terrible films but you just you learn a lot about like kind of what not to do by watching these great horrible films oh yeah are, are, you, a, are you a bad movie fan um I think I'm starting to become one I think at some point I was very uh, this is going to sound so uh, elitist in the worst way possible, but I think I was very precious with my brain. Um, right. I think I was very precious about the content that I exposed <laughs> this, this this delicate organ to. Um, and now I just realize, like you learn, like exactly what you're saying, you've learned from the bad things. And also, have you noticed in bad movies sometimes they come across something genius? You know? absolutely absolutely yes it's like it's that's also really interesting because you're like okay how how did you manage 90 minutes of of terrible writing you know absolutely. Like, yes and then minute 99 what what magic genius <laughs> yep yep absolutely well you know um one of my favorite movies is ed wood um which i i would really recommend that's about um yeah, do, are you familiar with that one? No, all? I'm not. And I was, I was actually going to ask you, what, your, what is your favorite bad movie? Um, so I'm well, glad. Ed Wood is a great movie, like a legitimately great movie, but it's about a, you know, terrible filmmaker. Ed Wood was this B movie filmmaker, um, like in the fifties, and uh, he's played by Johnny Depp in Ed Wood, and the, the thing about him is he was so genuine and there was nothing like campy about what he wanted. He wanted to be Orson Welles. He aspired to be great. And that's where like brilliant bad movies come from. It is a place of like wanting to be a great film. And I mean, the I think probably the most common cited example is The Room. Yeah. Um, which is like, I, I don't know if you've seen The Room, but- I have. Okay, yeah, times, but, unfortunately. Right. It's, like Tommy Wiseau believed, I think he was making a classic and that's how you get, you know, the best movies. There's this new sort of breed of like bad movies like Sharknado mm -hmm. that are sort of like nudging you and winking, like see how bad we are. But that's, to me, it's not as like entertaining as something that genuinely is trying to be great and like, you know, falls flat. Jeez, there's yeah. something so uh, depressing about that. Like, I don't know, because as an artist, do you ever run into that fear? Because you can see it, right? You're, you're a spectator of someone else 
trying and failing miserably and we're able to laugh to some extent to bring ourselves comfort because that's so embarrassing right but you ever write something you're like oh no what if I'm that and like obviously you're you know a paid writer and you know you you do really brilliant things so like you have those chips on your shoulder where you can be like no I'm great but like before that before all the the stardom of that where you're like oh no (laughs) is this bad oh I still do I mean I, I constantly I I worry that what I'm doing sucks even if it's you know writing a joke like you know writing an individual joke I'm like uh and I'll 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 um try reworking it over and over again because I'm still neurotic about you know what if what I'm doing is terrible and it's also kind of amazing to me that I've known I've known people who are terrible like they're not great in what they do but they don't have that neurotic quality where they're like quite confident they're like yeah I'm really good at this and I've always like admired that like to be not good but think that you're good that's that's a pretty uh pretty cool skill but (laughs) but most most you know writers that I know um who are you know really talented they're they're super like insecure about it you know (sighs) so it's kind of a weird conundrum um but if I could recommend one more amazing bad film Oh, please. Um, the Room is a very well-known, slightly lesser-known film. is called Fateful Findings. And it's by this guy named Neil Breen, who is like, um, he's like a real estate agent, yeah. but also like an aspiring filmmaker. And to watch one of his films is to, I mean, it's, I, I was gonna say, it's like, it's to touch the face of God. No, but it's, it's really quite an amazing experience because it's like, he is so shockingly bad at what he does. Like he, he's a terrible, he's also the star of all his films, like Tommy Wiseau. Oh so he's God. not a great actor. He's not um, a great writer, certainly not a great director, but he's so, earnest about what he does that there's this kind of weird like beauty to to the movies and he's trying to do something really deep in them so oh okay I'm gonna have to watch all these things because now I'm so like interested and it actually sounds like there's there's something underneath the surface that's like beautiful and interesting for sure for sure the only bad movie that I've watched where I, I knew I was going into a bad movie, aside from The Room, because like I, I didn't consent to watching The Room as many times <laughs> as I did. And, and that is a movie that unfortunately just is unconsensually watched a lot, like in right. lunchroom, hallway, like classrooms yeah. and stuff. It's like, what is happening? Um, but Trolls 2, have you heard oh, of this? Right. Yes. Troll, yeah, Troll 2. What's the um? What's the one thing that's missing from Troll Two? A troll. There's no. There is not a single troll that appears in Troll Two. Um. Yes, that's a that's a classic. We watched in our bad movie night club at one point. Um. Yeah, that's a that's a really bad bad movie, but very enjoyable. It was very enjoyable. It was um the first five minute minutes of it, and mind you, I was watching it to impress a boy. Um, so my motivations were already in the wrong place. Uh, I, I was like, I don't think this is worth it. Like, I don't think this, this man is worth watching this movie for. And then halfway through, I was like, you know what, (laughs) this is really funny. So I'm going to continue. Um, but no, there, there definitely is something to, to watching. I think we put a lot of, uh, pressure on people to know the classics. And I think there's definitely value to all the classics, obviously. Um, but it gets to a point where, you feel like watching anything like trashy or like kind of the fast food of like entertainment um, becomes like less important, but obviously like it is, I mean, and still part of pop culture. I mean, the room is like really important culturally, unfortunately, and also it's, it's true. I mean, watching bad stuff totally has value. I mean, in a variety of ways. One is that, you know, there are bad movies that like, like, um, fateful findings that are just so kind of genius in how awful they are. Um, And even in the room, there are things where you're like, that decision that he made to have like the character Denny walk into a room and sit on the floor unmotivated. He could have sat on a couch, 
But nope, he sat on the floor, then he stands up and then he's like, well, I gotta go. And you're like, that's amazing. Like, like why those choices were made kind of brilliant. Um, and then there's also bad movies that are, are actually just kind of bad where you watch them and you're like, oh yeah, that's a, that's a good reminder not to do whatever, yeah. you know. Yeah, you have the cautionary tales. Have you ever thought um, about trying to get uh, another movie made? Yeah, um, you know, the, the thing that I sold to Universal um, was like, I was sort of just out of um, film school when I sold it and I was like, woohoo, here we go. I'm gonna be like making movies and stuff. And it was such a long process of like, meetings and more meetings and more meetings and rewriting and more meetings and it was like three years before they were finally like yeah we're not going to make this movie and so um the the process of of filmmaking i mean especially like in the studio kind of system is so arduously slow and um so while it's really cool and and um I would maybe you know love to do something at some point it's just so slow it's that it's really agonizing and that's kind of one of the great things about tv is that if you get something on the air it's gonna like you know it's gonna get made you're you're going to be shooting it like soon um it's not this like very long development process so there's an immediacy for tv that's kind of satisfying Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. And it, it, the, the turnaround is just more interesting because whatever you're working on is, I, I feel potentially more relevant at times. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which is fun. Um, I guess, would you ever consider like doing it independently, like a film, just so there's not as much like bureaucracy involved um, or maybe doing your, your own show? I would love both of those things. Yeah, I mean, um, totally interested in both of those. Um, for now, I'm I'm sort of very happy playing in this sandbox of like network, you know, TV. So, um, like, I'm gonna sort of I think I'm gonna just sort of hang there for a while. But at some point, yeah, absolutely, it would be really fun to just kind of. Um, finance something like small budget and just kind of do it myself, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, just I, the experience, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Totally. So Get the cinematography skills out, you know, <laughs> yes. ask yourself once, sit on yeah. the, in the middle of the floor, stand up, gotta go. Right. Right. Exactly. One different, so it's not a rip off. Just like one little thing different, like to have a fedora and then it's over. It's different. That's right. Exactly. So. Yeah cut to a day one of shooting I'm in the sun like wait I forgot the sun <laughs> um, yeah so the well maybe but I, <laughs> yeah exactly maybe I can the whole film can take place like in a dark air conditioned room so yeah, yeah. oh that sounds that sounds interesting it does um, absolutely it sounds like a uh uh like a crisis moment though <laughs> like yeah. it sounds like a prisoner of war situation honestly right right <laughs> Right. Hey, if you can make that funny then that that'd be awesome or even dramatic like hey like I don't want to put you in a box um except if it's air conditioned um, <laughs> I guess so this is more of a like uh mm, technical question I guess um but like do you notice like on a professional level like any mis like common mistakes that writers still make um or like even like pet peeves you have for different ways you don't have to call them out but just things you're like structure or like mm, spelling or just like anything that you're like oh this is still happening hmm. I mean it's really funny because I it's funny you mentioned spelling because um like I'm I'm like such a type a speller I'm just a good speller I don't know why but I'm a really good speller and um that's not really important in writing you know I mean I've worked with lots of people who like legit cannot spell, like cannot spell at all. And while it's really fun to mock them, and I do a lot um, openly to their face, I will mock them. No, um, I don't, but I do a little bit. Um, it's not really important. I mean, like if you read a Tarantino script, um, that dude cannot spell at all. You know? 
but he is still, you know, a brilliant writer. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, it's so funny that a thing that I maybe thought was important being able to spell, it really doesn't matter. So um, the joke's on me for having spent time, you know, competing in spelling bees and shit like that. Where yeah. It doesn't matter. So. Just playing Scrabble and reading the dictionary for fun. <laughs> all that time. Speaking of the wasting time question, maybe that was where. <laughs> yes, yes, that's where it all began, I guess. Um, so, yeah, um, but no, no, no real pet peeves, you know. I mean, I, I guess one thing is that um, when it's funny, we were talking about, you know, watching classics versus bad movies. And I really do feel like a good, like, balanced diet is required where like you do have to have seen like the classics you know and um because those come up as shorthand you know where in, in especially in the writer's room where you know you mention a scene that's kind of like you know whatever the godfather or something and inevitably there's someone who's like oh i've never seen the godfather and it's like a, you know a lot of people are raised not watching movies a lot which totally understandable um but i do think it helps to kind of catch up on those and do 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 the homework and see you know those classics you know oh yeah like, I, I mean if you're a writer then like yeah. at some point <laughs> yeah. you gotta you gotta get there right um and that's not me saying i'm there i think i have a lot of things i still need to watch um for anyone who may be listening I'd be like Haley you didn't know that fucking scene shut up you know I just I know who listens to this and I know I'm gonna get a call <laughs> be like hey um gotta stay stay humble I guess I I don't know I, I think that that's really um yeah I I think it's like you said it's like knowing what came before so that you can like make something new or like kind of let it feed you um and that actually brings me to a question that um, I think is really relevant in this time, right? Um, so those of you who don't know Josh Greenberg, he is uh, extremely, if you haven't already found out, he's very funny, um, but specifically he's very funny with topical humor, um, i.e. the news and does a lot of memeage. Um, if anyone wants to follow him on Instagram or Facebook, I don't want to put out your Facebook, but no, no. you know. Anyways, he's very, very funny. I, I want to know how you balance like your news media diet, because that's such a, that's such a behemoth task at times. There's, it's so saturated. There's so many news sources out there. So many of them are, are bad. Uh, no, no offense to those news sources, but just bad, but also fun to make fun of. So you want to, you want to take those in too. Um, and then there's like TV and like new movies and old movies and like books. Uh, there are books behind you. So I assume you read, you're a fantastic speller. I assume you read some, how, what does that look like? Cause you're not like Fran, are you? Like, you're not like Fran Leibovitz just in a corner, you know, complaining all the time and reading books. Like you have a job, well, you had a job and you know, how, how did you do that, Josh? Well, first of all, every book you see behind me is a prop. Every book in my house is a prop. I, I do not read. No. Um, I, uh, I, this is a very good question. Um, I think I have to sort of like um, carefully like portion out how much news intake because especially with news because it can get like super, super depressing. Um, and especially during like the Trump era, I found it very, very depressing. Um, and I feel like we're just kind of coming out of that now um where like the news is boring again and that's like a great thing um <laughs> like for yesterday but well yeah i mean well, of course there's always you know stuff that's happening but you know um or, do you mean the matt gates thing or yeah well i mean of course yeah every day there's there's something but i guess it's not it doesn't feel like it's the same existential crisis every day of like oh fuck we're all fucking gonna die um yeah <laughs> that, was, that was really hard and like i remember during a trump like campaign speech he said something like if you if you elect sleepy joe um all the news is going to be so boring everyone's going to be so bored and it's like dude i will happily be bored then i'll take bored over terrified you know 
um so yeah so um uh yeah i guess what i'm saying is i'll, I'll just take in a little bit of news you know at a time um and as far as like um devouring like movies and tv and stuff um i don't i actually don't like to rewatch most things um yeah oh i think you got muted for a second oh no i i was this was my uh version oh, of like a, a side eye like it was, oh, I it was see, a moment I for us i was just saying I me too i also don't oh, like oh see i i'm so i'm such a doofus i didn't even get that. <laughs> um but yeah like my uh, my wife is very into you know the the things she loves are like comfort food so like the office and bob's burgers um she can rewatch them endlessly. And um, after I've seen stuff a couple of times, I tend not to rewatch it, you know, um, with the exception of certain movies like Clue that I will rewatch a lot. But um, I, I guess I'd usually rather watch a new thing than rewatch something I've, I've already seen. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. And that definitely cuts down on your, your time. Because yeah. you don't have to like rewatch things a million times to to feel it, you know. Do you feel like you have really high retention? No, no, I have, I have, I have a very limited retention. I think, like, I think my attention span has gotten really short. Like, um, so I'm. It, it's become harder, for instance, to read a like a big book. Like, I'll read, you know, a couple pages and be like, okay, gotta, gotta take a break from that now it's so yeah it's hard for me to retain stuff and it's harder for me to like sit still for a longer period of time yeah I think that may have come from either the TikTok era and that type of technology or the Trump era and always being terrified you know because like I I'm having the same thing and it's like teaching my dumb brain to focus like I'm, I'm trying to retrain it and be like there's nothing happening you have to just do this thing because I'll, I'll be reading Sophie's Choice and I'll be like, okay, this is, I need to, I need to put this down. I'm like, no, like you have the time to read this. Like just because TikTok is next to you doesn't mean you should put down this classic piece of literature right. to watch someone do a dance move. But like sometimes that's what it is, you know? Boy, talk about a Sophie's Choice. Sophie's yeah. Choice or TikTok. <laughs> oh my God. Um, <laughs> were, you really, were you really reading Sophie's Choice? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really halfway through Sophie's Choice. and. Wow it's getting hard it's brilliant have you i mean i know i've seen the movie yeah i haven't seen the movie yet which i'm really happy about because now i get to read the book and then see the movie it's Remember so it? funny it's so funny are you serious no i'm kidding that was a joke. <laughs> i'm no i'm sorry that was it's not it's not funny okay but, but for real like when the aliens come in at the end it is a really amazing <laughs> sorry why do i keep trying to misrepresent sylvie's choice it is neither funny nor is it a sci-fi. The horrible thing is I'm an extremely gullible person. <laughs> so when Sorry. you said that, I'm like, wow, what a spin. <laughs> Sorry, no, no aliens. No, okay, well, I was looking for, I'm still gonna look for the aliens because maybe <laughs> if you look hard enough, you'll find them. Um, yeah. I, we, are, we are coming to the end, um, but I do wanna ask you two very quick fire questions. Um, the first question is, if you weren't a comedy writer, what would you have been? Or what would you be now? Hmm. I mean, probably a Chippendales dancer, <laughs> I have to say. Um, uh, I, I, I think probably uh, um, working in journalism. Oh, really? The, sort of my sort of second, you know, choice of, you know, uh, occupation, I guess. Um, I studied that, you know, in, in school also. And, and, um, although I guess that's still writing in a, in a sense. So yeah, yeah I guess I, I'd still kind of be a writer. So I don't know, maybe, um, circus clown. I'm not sure. I, I, I feel honestly, like I love this so much. I love comedy writing so much that it's hard to imagine doing something else. Cause I, I'm so happy doing this. I mean, and that's perfect, right? Like that that's so fantastic that any second choice feels far worse than what you're doing now because you're doing yeah. this now. Um, but I do think it's beautiful that either way you would try to be a writer or a clown. 
Um, yes. This one lets you be both, which is so great. Um, right. And then my last question is, and this is going to sound very familiar, so I apologize uh, because I think I've asked you this already um, on, you know, like our, our call. Um, what what advice would you give to new upcoming um, comedian writers or comic writers? Hmm. Well, uh, I would say there are a few things. One, I would say, you know, read as many scripts as you can. Um, the nice thing is like back in the day, you had to like go to like a film library, you know, and now they're all online. Like you can look up films or TV shows of any genre and read them, you know, and it's just really good to like see what's come before and also check out like different styles. And, and um, those are just great learning tools. Like, do I want to write like this person or like this person? Um, so that's really important. And, and watching all those, you know, films and TV shows is, is really important. Um, and then I, I, I would also say like um, doing standup is hugely helpful as a writer, um, especially like being in a writer's room it's just really good with like um, helping with confidence and speaking up because I'm I'm a very shy person naturally um, and I think a lot of writers are so I think getting out of your comfort zone is is really really helpful um, in you know conditioning you to to speak up and be participatory in the in the writer's room. Yeah, it also gives you such instant feedback which is something you don't get with scripts. So yeah, yeah, you have a better sure. idea when you get to the script, what type of things people are gonna to react to, or at least that's what I found. Yeah, yeah, I mean, in a comedy writer's room, it, you actually do get, it's kind of the closest, like, you know, uh, uh, duplication of the, of the stand-up experience where like, if you're pitching jokes, you know when a joke works because like, a lot of times you'll pitch and it'll be dead silence and then you go home and cry and then a lot of times you know you, you hopefully you pitch and the whole room laughs and it's so damn satisfying and then a week later you're shooting that in front of an audience and you know the same joke gets a laugh from like you know a couple hundred people and you're like oh that was so cool um so yeah, I mean, stand up is just a really good sort of training ground, I think, for being in the writer's room. Yeah, so. I, I mean, that, that is awesome. And as a fan of stand up, I'm like, yes, 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 yes. You know, um, Josh, you're absolutely fabulous. And I'm so happy that you came on the podcast and shared, you know, all your love for bad movies and good movies and your experience and, you know, your, your very like, you know, diverse, like writing room experience, you know, um, I guess where, where can the people find you and keep up with you and keep up with all your awesomeness? Oh boy. Um, well, uh, I'm on Friendster and MySpace. Um, uh, I am actually, I do post a bunch on Facebook and I'm, you know, post moderately on Instagram. You can find me at, um, Mr. Josh Greenberg, um, uh, on Instagram and Facebook, uh, and I think that's pretty much it, yeah. Yeah, and if anyone is driving or operating heavy equipment right now, don't worry, that will be in the bio, so you don't have to stop working that forklift right now. Um, please don't, you're on the job. Uh, it's really unprofessional. Larry, you did this last week, and we were very disappointed. Um, and if you want- <laughs> huh? I, I, That's an important message you're putting out there, I'm, I'm glad. Yeah. We, we always include a PSI um, for, for safety of forklift operators. You would be surprised how much of the good talk people are forklift operators. I bet. Um, <laughs> and if you want more of me, Haley Hackett, you can find me on Instagram at Haley Hackett Talks. And if you want more good talks with good people, and I know you do, follow us on Instagram at Good Talk With and tune in next time for more good talks with good people. Thanks. Thank you, Josh. Thanks for having me, Haley.